मेरी जमी महबूब मेरी मेरी नस नस में तेरा इश्क वे फी कान पड़े कभी रंग तेरा जिस निकल के The title for the session is Medieval Period. We have amongst us a panel of distinguished and eminent resource persons. We welcome moderator for the session, Mr. Shiv Kunal Varma, Lieutenant General K. J. Singh, Colonel Ajay Raina, and Mr. J. Sai Deepak. I request honorable guests to kindly take their seats on the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the three panelists. Mr. Sai Deepak will be joining us in another 5-10 minutes. Um, we have with us a very eminent panel today. And let me start with introducing Lieutenant General K.J. Singh, who actually needs no introduction because he is almost an integral part of this military history movement. We have had, as you know, six editions before this. And he is a, he has sort of been part of it from the inaugural session in 2017. So let's give him a big hand because he is a veteran in every sense. Colonel Ajay Raina, Sena Medal. In my considered view, I think he's one of the finest military history emerging writers in this country. Sai Deepak is a, he, he argues in the Supreme Court, he's a constitutional expert. He'll be joining us shortly also. There is a practical necessity to know about the military history of India and the perspective it gives on the critical aspects of warfare in the subcontinent to defend India. Because the maxim is so evident, its centrality in deciding the fortunes of India at critical junctures in our history has been overlooked for the most part. Geography is also a crucial part, aspect of war, because terrain dictates both strategy and tactics and decides destiny changing outcomes. Intertwined with terrain is climate. Together they author and alter history and nowhere is this more pronounced than in India. Some of you might ask these two questions of, how, of what the practical use of medieval military history is in today's world and whether it is an unprofitable act of pedantry. One such eminent figure of the medieval period, which I personally find fascinating, is Sher Shah Suri. He is one man of that time under whose administration his army never lost. Suri, born as Farid Khan, was one of the most influential figures whose ascension to the throne marks a turning point in the medieval period. On the throne from 1540 to 1545, he left an indelible mark on the socio-political framework of India. He deliberated on efficient and accountable governmental practices emerging from the effective administrations, administrative reforms imposed by him. Alongside, he also introduced a standardized currency, well-organized postal system, and a network of roads and highways, today famously known as the Grand Trunk Road. History plays an important role in shaping the future of a nation. Among the great kings and queens who played lead roles in spectacular drama of India's past, Babur and Humayu hold very important positions. Babur, who distinguished himself as a warrior and writer, was the founder of Mughal Empire in India. He was the true heir of Genghis Khan and Amir Timur. Babur ruled in North India for only four years from 1526 to 1530 Common Era, fighting battles all the time. His time saw the popularization of gunpowder and artillery in India. For the first time since the downfall of Kushan Empire, Kabul and Kandhar became integral parts of Mughal Empire. By dominating them, Babur and his successors were able to protect India from external invasions for almost 200 years. 
Humayun expanded the frontiers of the empire, but lost it to Afghan ruler Sher Shah Suri, who drove him into exile. Humayun took refuge in the count of Safavid ruler of Iran. In 1555, Humayun defeated Sher Shah Suri. You must have heard Humayun being described as he tumbled through life and tumbled out of it. I have a strong aversion towards Mughals for the fact that they could do anything to gain power, be it killing of their blood relatives. The Vijayanagara Empire, also called the Karnataka Kingdom, was a medieval Indian empire that covered much of the region of South India, ruling the land of modern states of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Goa, and some parts of Telangana and Maharashtra. It was established in 1336 by the brothers Harihara and Bukka, first of Sangam dynasty, members of a pastoralist cowherd community that claimed Yadav lineage. The empire rose to prominence as a culmination of attempts by the southern powers to ward off Turko Persian Islamic invasion by the end of the 13th century. It lasted until 1646, although its power declined after a major military defeat in the Battle of Talikota in 1565 by combined armies of Deccan Sultanates. The empire is named after its capital city of Vijayanagar, whose ruins present day Hampi. The challenge that forced the Vijayanagar Empire at the time, as well as the empire's size, and one of a kind of situation that required a vast and powerful army and military system to sustain its stability and maintain its border. Letters are sign of things, symbols of words, whose power is so great that without a voice they speak to us the words by the eyes, not by the ears. What is medieval period? Medieval period is a period between ancient period and modern period. Early medieval period is also known as dark ages. This age showed regional and political progress. A lot of dynasty and empires were formed during this period. When medieval period was started, medieval period is divided into two parts, early medieval period and late medieval period. Early medieval period was started from 6th century and ended with 13th century. Late medieval period was started from the end of early medieval period, 13th century and ended with 16th century. We get to know about medieval period was started with Muhammad bin Qasim from many manuscripts and books, more important one is Chachnama. But who is Muhammad bin Qasim? Muhammad bin Qasim was born 31 December 695 AD and died 18 July 715 AD at the age of 20. His father name was Muhammad Hakam and his mother name was Habibat Uzma. He was the commander of Al Hazaz who sended him to capture the land and take revenge. Muhammad bin Qasim ke saath yeh kaal tha shuru hua. Al Hazaj ka sena pati Bharat ko na manzoor hua. Sindh par hamla karne wale Sindh ko haraya tha. Dahir ko ghutno par la kar apna raj basaya tha. Sidha Sindh par na kar makran se agas kiya. Makran luta mullan luta Sindh ko gulam kiya. Jajiya kar jaysay karo ko usne lagu karaya tha. Hinduon ki jaan ko haan usne khel banaya tha. Vidwa viklan pandit chhoď kar. Na jane usne kya darshaya tha. Dil mein rahem ki jaga thi. Ya natak usne banaya. Logo ko pida bhi di to marham usne lagaya. India is a nation of warriors. Warriors not only molded by their own people but also strengthened by foreign invasions referred to by some historians as the invader's paradise. India has confronted numerous foreign incursions spanning from the Aryan invasions in the ancient times to the Greek and Seleucid invasions during the transitional period and later the Arab invasion led by Muhammad bin Qasim. Qasim's subjugation of Punjab and Sindh left a profound impact on the broader society. Subsequently, between 1001 and 1206 AD, the Turkish invasions reshaped history with figures like Muhammad of Ghori and Ghazni invading the prosperous Indo-Gangetic plains and plundering their riches. This period marked the decline of small princely states and, ex and the expansion of global trade connections. As we delve further into the medieval, medieval era, we observe a significant enhance enhancement of military capabilities across various regions of India. 
during the evolution of the slave dynasty. Qutbuddin Abak formed a standing army and consolidated his control over northern India, even during the lifetime of Gori. From my viewpoint, this marked the strengthening of the Delhi Sultanate's authority through the development of cavalry and artillery units within its military, making it the preeminent military force in many Muslim communities. Shivaji employed rudimentary technology and communicated with foreign entities to gain insights into their methods of constructing large boats and ships. Thus, in my view, this is the current stature of the Indian military, a formidable force whose foundations have been fortified by countless dynasties and visionary leaders hailing from diverse communities and geographic regions. Asim andhkar me bhatak rahe sajal nayan na path de rahi dhara na jyoti de raha gagan samay kahi vahek gaya kahi chahek gaya na tum vahi na mai vahi samay hame badal gaya samay hame badal gaya people who choose to ignore history tend to miss out the important lessons it had to teach during the medieval period in india the subcontinent was divided into various regional kingdoms hamare yahan cholas the rajputs the deccan sultanate thi and then came the mughals just imagine a scene straight out of an epic adventure where destiny comes together to lay the foundation of the magnificent mughal empire babur's establishment of the mughal empire laid the foundation of one of the most influential dynasties in the history of india jab badshahon ke muh se khuda ki tareef nikle humne usko taj mahal ke roop mein dekha from bollywood songs to advertisements today and of course being one of the seven wonders let's reflect upon the profound words of akbar gaur farmayega ibadat ke adab se khalik ne hame nawaza hai it is through the grace of divine wisdom that we have been bestowed the privilege of this remarkable era the mughals focused on harnessing the power of gunpowder as one of my delegates mentioned here they used more of traditional methods dhanush talwar dal and what not historical takes on the mughal empire are like a colorful spice bazaar where different scholars offer their unique flavors of interpretation european visitors like sir thomas roe wrote positively about his experience at the mughal court british historians like james mill brewed a cup of controversy stirring in the idea of a muslim mughal rule over a hindu majority in his book irfan habib provides insights into the socio economic and political dynamics at of the mughal era after centuries of enduring the rise and fall of empires mughal to british we proudly sit here as united and offer homage to our great nation and while well, that being said i would like to end my speech with a quote sogand mujhe is dharti ki ye desh nahi mitne dunga ye desh nahi rukne dunga वचन है मेरा भारत माँ को तेरा शीश नहीं झुकने दूंगा तेरा शीश नहीं झुकने दूंगा द मुगल्स हैव एंड एन अनडिनाइबल इम्पैक्ट ऑन इंडिया एंड इट्स हिस्ट्री फ्रॉम देम इम्प्लीमेंटिंग देर ब्रिलियंट मिलिट्री स्ट्रैटेजीज टू देम बिल्डिंग ब्यूटिफुल मोन्यूमेंट्स विद देर ब्रिलियंट आर्किटेक्चुरल स्किल्स एंड ऑल द वे टू देम कंसिडरिंग इंडिया देयर होम एंड इंटरटाइनिंग देयर रिच कल्टर कल्चरल हेरिटेज विद आज but we must admit their invasions in india have been characterized by brutality betrayal and endless pillaging many factors played in a, in a role in the establishment of the mughal empire namely disunity among kingdoms the fall of the delhi sultanate and the infighting and betrayal within kingdoms on one hand i admire the courage of babur in defending india from the mongols but i must admit the same shades were not seen in his son humayu who was defeated easily by sher shah suri and exiled to persia but even though babur even though humayu won the last war i admire and i applaud sher shah's political administrative and welfare initiative humayu died falling off a staircase in his library and was replaced with a 13 year old child a 13 year old named akbar akbar was young and very young at the time so he had to entrust his empire to bairam khan because he could not rule at an age of just 13 
Behram Khan ruled with an iron fist and was famous for his absolutely tyrannical methods but was eventually ousted due to unrest within the military. Akbar, on the other hand, had two main military strategies, which were matrimonial alliances and his recruitment system. Akbar married several daughters of really strong kingdoms, such as Harka Bai and Raja Bharmal of Ambar, which is a perfect segue into my next point, which is that Akbar was very religiously tolerant towards religion and ju thus towards Rajputs, who helped him with all their military prowess, such as Raja Man Singh. His other military tactic was how he gathered his army. He didn't recruit his soldiers directly, but instead used the Mansabdari system, which basically meant that Akbar, uh, that nobles and local lords would be provided with special favors and ranked uh, uh, favorably, depending on the number of soldiers they provided. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that the Mughal should be evaluated not as a whole, but individually. I can say this without being a hypocrite, because Jazia, which was a very heavy tax on people, was removed by Akbar. He also inaugurated several Ibadat Khane, which were places for several different types of Mughal, several different types of Muslims to convene and discuss religion without fear of punishment. The medieval period in India, spanning from the 7th to the 16th century, was characterized by the coexistence of diverse cultures, the rise and fall of powerful dynasties, leaving a lasting impact on the subcontinent's rich history. It was a time of cultural unity, economic prosperity, and political upheaval that stepped up the stage for developments in the Indian subcontinent. The period witnessed a rich exchange of cultures and ideas between the incoming in Islamic rulers and existing Hindu and Buddhist traditions. This led to the development of Indo-Islamic architecture, art and literature, exemplified by structures like the Qutub Minar and fusion of Persian and Indian artistic styles. Thus, the period was a very progressive one. The Mahdi Delhi Sultanate. The period started when the Second Battle of Tarai. In the battle, Prithvira Chauhan was defeated by the Muhammad of Ghor, who in turn left his slave Kutubuddin Abak to rule over Delhi, thus marking the humble beginning of the first dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate, the Mamluk dynasty. Abak was succeeded by his slave turned son in law, Shamsuddin Ildutmish. Then came the Khilji dynasty, amongst whom Alauddin Khilji stands the tallest for many of his notab notable achievements. He, re he realized that the empire's economy and military might go hand in hand, something which even Pakistan has not understood till now. Thus, having, ma having a firm economic base, base he re raised an army of nearly three lakh. Thank you very much. Well, we've heard the student delegates and most of them have given you a rundown of what the Sultanate was, what the Mughals were and a lot of the stuff which you've heard is based on what they've read, what their perceptions are, because this is what has been put out in the history books for the last 50, 60, 70 years, ever since independence. If you look at Delhi, for example, which is our, which is our national capital, almost all the major highways, etc., all the major roads, etc., all named after Mughal emperors, etc. But a lot is beginning to change now. A lot of a new narrative is beginning to come up, which is not a new narrative as such, but for the first time, people are beginning to look beyond what we were asked to inherit by, in our textbooks when we gained independence. So, I'll start with General K.J. Singh, sir. Give us a brief summary, sir. Of what, what, you see, right now we are, we are listening to the delegates talking about this one came in, this one came in, did so much good for us. But actually, we've had the Arabs, the Persians, the Turks, the Afghans, the Mongols, everybody sitting on the western flank of India. And they are literally poised to come in and see what they can get. So what are they? Give, give us a bit of a brief history on that, sir. Jai Hind, everybody. And thanks to organizers. I am here seventh time. Actually, I am becoming more like a furniture over here. You know, everybody is recognizing me. But this time when I was given this section, I thought Shiv Kunal has decided to take a revenge on me finally. So, I had to do a lot of reading into history and 
I would start by saying that it's an afternoon session. Let me ask you a question. How is the Josh? But if I was to ask you how is the Josh, the answer will be nothing. Because in today's social media driven age, we are looking at history for different purposes, for building narratives. We were told that you need mantrana shakti, you need yojana shakti, you need utsaha vardhan. Unfortunately, lots of it is being used for utsaha vardhan. I am sorry to point this out because then what Admiral Chauhan said, we will repeat our mistakes. Medieval period in my understanding is a wake-up call for India. It is a wake-up call. India which was no, no India. There were rulers who were fighting with each other. Raja Dahir was an imposter into a dynasty. He was not accepted by Jats. He had married his own stepsister. So somebody from Makran and all these people at that time in 7th century common era the situation was Islam was well established. Islam had extended into Egypt, it had gone into northern Africa, it had even gone into Spain besides controlling what is West Asia or Middle East today. So it needed to come to a richer part of the world to loot, to plunder and we were ready. And they demonstrated to us the power of disruptive technology and disruptive strategy. We will discuss about it later, but let me tell you, where did the gunpowder come from? Who brought the gunpowder? They brought it here. But where did they get it from? They got it from Chinese. In the morning, we've done a lot of utsah vardhan and painted Chinese as dwarfs, you know, two and a half feet or one and a half feet tall. Let's not forget the whole world trade centered either, either on silk, ceramics, tea, herbs, gunpowder, paper. Where did it all come from? China. So except for that one brief century of humiliation or colonialism, Chinese have always had the the facility to improvise. So unless you children gain utsa, josh is good, gain please. I also pump myself up every day by going for my jog and run and everything and seeing Facebook profile of Yash Mor, my <laughs> friend. But, but it's also enough to, it's also important to what our honorable governor said, what uh, Mr. Darshan Singh said, Indulge in disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence and all this. The Mughals, the Arabs demonstrated this to us. It was not Mohammed bin Qasim really, but it was later invaders who, who showed us that you cannot lead blind cavalry charges and hold on to your territories. And you cannot be fighting amongst yourself and just pretend that you are a Bharat Varsha. You can be Bharat Vash if you all of you collaborate together. This is my initial submission. I have already heckled some feathers, but uh, this is a seminar. Why not? Knowledge has to be shared like this. Thank you. Now, you know, Sai, in fact, this is the biggest problem today that in a, in a society where we are also polarized to a great extent, where a lot of the stuff is today being once one, one, one half of the, uh, you know, we, we say this is the new, this is the new, this is what was, what we inherited is flawed. We want to look at something afresh, but the moment we look at it afresh, it's always given sort of communal hues, etc., etc. So let's, let's get your view about the earlier part, you know, where the, from Kazim to the Turks, you know, with Mahmud Ghazdi, etc., when they came, what was the, the initial fear psychosis which actually was created and how do we really do this without, how do we put that narrative to the rest of the country today right. without getting counterattacked at every step? Frankly, I think what has worked for me so far and my experience in writing the first two books, I'd like to share that because I think that is what has triggered a certain shift in a certain discussion. 
if i had started my position with an opinion or an ideological position i would have effectively lost the audience nobody would be interested in listening to an opinion unless and until there is a fact that is supporting that particular opinion so i am not in the business of revisionism of history or fabrication of history or an alternative viewpoint just for the sake of it right i am asking myself this basic question as to what we have received so far does it have any basis or was it more about fabricating a certain point of view without basis that's how i have gone about it in understanding the medieval period and specifically what happened after the invasion of sindh by qasim the one thing that we forget is that it took muslims of the particular period at least 3 centuries to cross over into what we know as the core heartland of bharat yeah that is until the 11th century or late 10th century that incursion after the invasion of sindh hadn't translated to a proper conquest second uh, i am not a military historian so i cannot comment on the flaws in our military strategy so i will not go in that particular direction but we must realize that for a very long time the rulers of this country were used to certain codes of conduct when it comes to conduct of wars and battles which was not shared by obviously the invading hordes in my view there was not enough research done or there was not enough effort spent by the rulers of that period to understand what is the psyche that they were exactly dealing with or engaging with frankly until chhatrapati shivaji or for that matter even the earliest possible instance i can give credit for is uh, the establishment of the vijayanagara empire until then there was not enough analysis done of the adversary that you're dealing with from a theological perspective from a psychological perspective it's not enough to understand your adversary purely from a strategic perspective in terms of what is the military tactics that they employ if i'm in a fight with any person the one question that i would always ask is this how crazy is he capable of going what is the bar that he has set for himself is he capable of pillage plunder genocide and what not these are basic questions that you must ask the the art of going strategically crazy is something that we have understood only recently until then i don't think we have understood it at all so that period according to me the invasion of sindh did not actually create too much of a psyche or a fear psychosis that was seen perhaps as a blip in the radar because for the next 3 centuries we did not understand what was happening in the rest of the world and what is the tsunami that's coming our way it started only in the 10th and the 11th centuries when we finally realized that this was going to be a regular feature and that the northwestern frontier was going to be a regular uh, let's say uh, battleground that realization dawned much much later now i completely agree with what the previous panelists said and i don't think i would disagree with them at all that having a cultural notion as bharat varsha is not the same as acting as a concerted political entity yeah so the question that i would want to ask myself is at least after regular invasions in the 10th century or the 11th century was there any attempt on the part of the rulers of this country to talk to each other to understand how to deal with it as one single unit cultural unit or political unit or whatever it may be in my limited understanding i haven't seen too many examples of that i haven't seen too many let's say instances of that so i am not going to fabricate history to somehow support and say because there is a bharat varsha there must have been some sense of unity right the fact is every ruler fights for his territory fights for his freedom but they were equally fighting for dharma because they saw themselves as protectors of dharma for their realms but was there any person looking out for the interest of this entire subcontinent as a hindu or a dharmic subcontinent outside of his political territory the answer to that has to be a resounding no that's a fact so i can't even deny that that is precisely why i think these days there is a lot more conversation which is a legitimate conversation on swayambodh and shatrubodh which is it's equally important for you to have a clear, clear sense of who you are and as much as you spend time understanding who you are you should also try and understand the adversary or the psychology of the adversary unfortunately despite thousand years of invasion the and and the constant uh, let's say worshiping of chanakya as as one of our leading role models when it comes to strategic issues our focus on shatrubodh particularly when it comes to middle eastern mentality has been relatively late and relatively recent that's a fact you talk about the sindh and you know the the northwest frontier province yes 
I have come to Colonel Raina on this question. You have done a lot of work on the uh, on Kashmir and uh, not just the Kashmir Valley, but that entire area, Noshera, Mirpur, th that entire belt. Uh, this is the basic route taken by just about everybody who came in, and even the Delhi Sultanate, which you know, the way everybody today seems to think about the Delhi Sultanate is that they were the ones who were the bulwark against the Mughal, but people forget that the Del De Delhi Sultanate itself was five different dynasties coming into India. And, and, but they were all coming in from that direction. So what is it about, what was, give us a bit of a background about n Northern Punjab or, or Punjab as the bulwark and the last thing. Because you see, the other problem was that the other fighting uh, the, the, the defenders, so to speak, the Rajputs, etc., a little bit more to the south, you know, and, the, and Sikhism hasn't come up as a, as a bulwark against uh, any kind of invasion. So, so your views on that? I'll take, uh, take from what, where Mr. Sai is left with a very good question. Uh, what was happening after invasion of Sindh uh, and what uh, you are asking that what happened to Punjab thereafter because there's a gap of three centuries. Uh, Sindh was invaded in uh, uh, 18th century, beginning. And Punjab, which uh, Mr. Shukunal Verma is wanting to, me to discuss, actually the Islam arrived in 11th century. So where we failed, the Shatru both. Now what happened is that when Sindh was taken by Arabs, it's not that they didn't try to come up, up north. One of them in fact went all the way to Kashmir but unsuccessfully came back. In between what happened in southern Punjab, when we, I say southern Punjab, I'm looking at the area where you know, Satulaj and Indus are the meeting and uh, southern Dera Jat, that is Dera, Ghazi Khan, Multan, Bhavalpur. In this area, what happened after invasion of Sindh? That preachers or missionaries started coming up along the rivers. And they were intelligent enough to set up their bases next to the rivers. Because rivers were the, also the roots of migration or population which will herd the animals, cattle, whatever. So over a period of time, another thing which was happening inside our own home was uh, a bit of rigidity on part of a cultural divide or whatever you may call it. So there was fault lines which were here available already. So what they did, they very peacefully and in a very uh, loving way, they exploited that through peaceful preaching without fighting and they started having a fan, fan falling. In fact, if you study uh, the so-called Sufi shrines which are along the these rivers, you will realize that over a period of time, the population which became loyal to those shrines, later on started fighting for the shrines, they, didn't, they stopped bothering about the kingdoms. So if there were 10 shrines in one kingdom, hypothetically speaking, so you'll have 10 kinds of community defending each other or uh, their own uh, turf. So these three centuries actually saw, before Mahmud came in, Mahmud of Ghazni, that a very peaceful way was adopted uh, for intruding into our heartland. Because that time, Hindu Shai Empire, which was Kabul Shahi Hindu Shai, which controlled all the uh, territory from Kabul to Lahore and to the east of Lahore, they were having their own issues, they were, they were having their own fights. There, there were times when Kabul was lost for seven years, then it was regained by Hindu Shais. Now, when all this was happening, missionaries were coming in and they were being accepted because they didn't come with a sword. So, if you allow me to call that thing as hostiles or whatever who had some issues against us. So, Shatru Bodh mein hum fail ho gaye. So, we allowed that thing to come and when the Ghazni came, before arrival of Mahmud of Ghazni, uh, there were many missionaries already, missionaries already established in heartland of Punjab. And you asked me about my area of Kashmir and Jammu and uh, that area. One delegate very well said that it was no, left in no man's land because the main route of in, coming into India, invading India was Punjab, heartland Punjab. And because of geography, because of Jhelum and Chinab and all those corridors there, largely, initially it was left out. But Gajani did attempt to take on, uh, uh, get into Kashmir three times, he failed. But when he failed, he failed because he was stopped at a place called Lohara Court in Punch. Loran Mandi is the name of the place today, there's a fort there. While Gajani couldn't proceed into Kashmir Valley per se, the preachers with him, who accompanied him, they actually converted the population around Punch, Mirpur, Nushara area. So while he couldn't uh, win the ultimate battle of reaching Kashmir, this area was converted. And thereafter, after arrival of Ghazni, it's been sword, it's been mix of sword and missionary preaching, everything happened. And of course, thereafter, things are very clear. Delhi Sultanate, some delegate already covered. So 320 years, uh, 
because of fault lines and while we may say that Mughals came because Delhi Sultanate failed, but failed was where did the Delhi Sultanate come from? So where were their roots? They were not so-called Indians per se. They all came from West. So basically it was one guy replacing another guy. So five dynasties, but then they had some good points. Rajya Sultan, the only uh, lady uh, emperor or ruler in India we ever had that time. Uh, she ruled for three years during uh, slave and Mamluk uh, dynasty. Uh, Tughlaqs had the funny idea of shifting the capital from Delhi to Doltabad. So those things kept on happening. Khilji had his own, own uh, infatuations. So 320 years of Delhi Sultanate uh, finally giving into Mughal. Of course, Mughal, uh, Mughals when they came in, uh, already been spoken well by a lot of delegates, so I'll not go, to, go there. Thing to understand is, sir, that three centuries between invasion of Sindh and invasion of Heartland Punjab, invasion by sword, there was a game played where population was taken over, the psyche was kind of shifted to other direction peacefully and we, we had no clue what was happening. Now, uh, elaborate on the military system that existed at that time with special emphasis. You know, Balban again has been kind of forgotten because the Mongol would have been the third wave, so to speak, if they had, had succeeded in getting past the Bayas. Uh, but it was Balban who actually stopped them. So, what was the military systems which, which allowed these guys again and again to just keep coming with actually nobody being able to put up any kind of a defensive, even a semblance of a fight, sir? Like uh, we have spoken of Shatru both and we have spoken of value-based war fighting. Now caught up in this value-based war fighting, most of our rulers, Pratiharas, Guzars, Palas, all these rulers were caught in this fascination of cavalry charges, masked elephants, and they would not look at defense as a kind of a... It was only Shivaji who brought this concept of forts and all. But before Shivaji, there was another person, Balban, who was actually a slave. And he was a, a slave from Central Asia. And he had got into this... And when he was given charge to prove himself, he established a line of forts which extended right till Batinda. They were defensive forts and they were used to launch forays. Actually, if uh, you allow me to go a little further, this concept was very intelligently used uh, in the first battle of Panipat, where uh, Babar came out with a concept of Tulghums. Now this concept was based on this that you divide your force into various tiers or various echelons. So you have a forward echelon, you had a rear echelon, you have flanks and he set up his battlefield in such a way that he secured his flanks, kept these mobile kind of elements and then he combined it with something called as Araba. Araba is, he got hold of 400 odd bullock carts, tied them up with each other with animal hide ropes so that the bullock carts will not yield space. They will remain there. And they, he used those as a mobile kind of a platform from where he could bring his matchlocks, his guns and fire. And the problem on the other hand was they were not used to all this. This is what is the concept of disruptive technology is there, which we are trying to tell our children that when you get drones, it disrupts you. You don't know what to do. It's some new animal which has come and you don't have credible defense against it. So here, our friend Babar, he brought this and he started, combined it with artillery guns. Now on the other side, they are not used to hearing the guns. So their elephants are bolting. They are turning tail and running. They are not, log not like those four or five good elephants whom you could, you know, join your hands and say, please go away. They just turn back and trample on the forces. So, 
a very intelligent combination of this system is seen by Balban and carried forward by Babur. It's, it's, it's something which was practiced in Battle of Khanba, it was practiced in First Battle of Panipat, and on the other side was Ibrahim Lodi. But Ibrahim Lodi, having stayed in India, had, had imbibed Indian Dharma and Indian method of war fighting. Sorry, ma'am, please pardon me. You're looking at me with little this thing. I'm not, when I'm saying Indian, I am also Indian. I fought the Indian Army since, no, I... So, it was, it was that time prevalent Indian Army concept that you do not, you know, do these kind of things. You were too much on values. So, Ibrahim Lodi was also following it. But, Babar used it against him. And thank God, this, I will take two more minutes. This period also spawned Let's not get very despondent. Marana Pratap, he brought out guerrilla warfare. So guerrilla warfare started from Marana Pratap and Shivaji. And if I was to ask these children, like Admiral Chauhan asked you about Queen Araba, do you know about a man called as Lachit Bodfukan? Anybody, honestly. Chalo, I am impressed the RMC guys have raised their hand because NDS has got a statue of that great general. He is the only person who defeated Aurangzeb. So there were people and like what Sai Deepak is saying, they were not talking to each other. After all, who was fighting Marana Pratap? Uh, Marana Pratap was being opposed by Akbar's commander-in-chief who was Sabai Man Singh of Jaipur and who was fighting Lachit Parfukan, Savai Jai Singh of Jaipur. Sai, uh, let's come to Akbar. Okay, I think he's one of the most fascinating characters in history because firstly, Akbar, you know, he's, he starts getting more and more. Initially, as a 13-year-old under Bairam Khan, the battle with Ebu, he's a kid. He was not even part of the Paripat war battle. They brought him up and when they got the unconscious him, Bairam Khan asked him to chop off his head. The Mughal chroniclers have later tried to change that narrative because they wanted to portray Akbar as a very magnanimous guy. But actually Akbar did what he was told to do. Even if you see the battle of Radhabbo, uh, the brutality which Akbar has displayed is no less than Gardi or anybody. I mean, he, the skull tower, which, which was a tactic which was used by everybody. Correct. Yet Akbar becomes a kind of a transformed leader somewhere along the line, partly because of the kind of work he also did in encouraging the arts, encouraging the uh, various things, and they, they, you know, he, then he forms his own religion, this, that, etc. Do you really consider Akbar as some sort of a watershed where the, uh, the Mughals stop being looked at or stop seeing themselves as outsiders and more as insiders? No, I don't. Um, I think the fabrication of Akbar as a watershed must be credited to the retrospective imputation of secularism to the brutality of history. And that is more of a fabrication post the 50s and 60s uh, by the coterie of uh, leftist Marxist uh, writers which uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru put together and under his able patronage this was crafted. See the thing is the numbers may be significantly different between his predecessors and his and himself. And it is equally a fact, which I will not deny, that almost towards the end of his life, Akbar almost became an apostate. He did not see himself as a practicing devout Muslim. That much is clear. But the fact of the matter is, we must realize that Islamic rulers are significantly in the hands of their, of their clergy. So even if he did not have any compulsion from within to do what his predecessors did, he was surrounded by very powerful clergy who were increasingly critical of his flirtations with religious leaders of other communities. Most people don't realize that uh, Sayyid Ahmad Sirhindi, who is seen as the progenitor, the ideological progenitor of Dehlavi, lived during Akbar's period and he was an extremely powerful Sufi saint or a Sufi order uh, clergy member. I think he comes from the Nakshbandi order. So, when these people existed, 
it was impossible for him to deviate significantly from the, from the path that his predecessors had chosen for themselves. If, if at all there was any sense of nativity that the Mughals ever had, to some extent you can say that Akbar was that blip in the radar. But things went back to square one immediately after Akbar. Even Shah Jahan was nowhere close to Akbar in terms of tolerance and whatnot. Each of them constantly wrote letters or even their hearts were pining to go back to Samarkand. Their, di their diaries and chronicles constantly say, we will someday go back. Yeah, we because buddy? they were prevented by the Uzbeks from going to that place. So I don't believe that they ever embraced this land. In today's parlance, I will see them as settler colonizers. That is the language that I would use. They were not plunderers and looters in the mold of the Afghans, but they were certainly settler colonizers, which means that they had their epicenter or their focus and their, and their, and their uh, eyes were focused on something else, which is outside the subcontinent. But this land was constantly seen as the launch pad in the hope that someday they would have the wherewithal to go to that place. That's one. Two, in terms of sheer brutality and in terms of uh, number of people killed and the massacres of civilians that were undertaken at the behest of Akbar, he was no exception to Babur or Aurangzeb for that matter. I'll just have one point to make and just please consider this. History has been extremely unkind to the Rajputs, especially the ones who uh, allied with Akbar. When they know for a fact that it's going to be almost impossible or next to impossible to defeat this green tsunami, the only thing that they could do is to try and stem it. And they had to protect their, uh, their people as well as their temples. The literature about, let's say, Mansing, or for that matter, even Jaijand, who is constantly portrayed as a traitor, I'm sorry to say people haven't done their reading to read the histories of each of these Rajput rulers, and how they tried to protect Dharma, people, and their own responsibility and their territories, while allying with the Mughals. So there is a fantastic uh, piece of literature which shows that how Raja Mansingh, when he had the opportunity to actually follow Ra Maharana Pratap in the battle of Haldigati, he chose not to do so, giving an opportunity to the object of defeat to run away from the battlefield because he said, let him go and continue it's his battle. He actually had the opportunity to go after him and finish him if he wanted to. Man Singh held back his forces. This is documented literature. That is true. Yeah. So I would suggest that before we see them as traitors, we realize the circumstances in which they lived. Because going by that logic, every person who occupied a position under the colonial establishment here must be seen as a traitor. And that would include a lot of our so-called independent freedom fighters as well. So sometimes you have to ally with the tyrant to protect your people from being killed at the altar of faith. That is exactly the tactic that was employed by the Rajputs and how they revived so many of their practices, how they rebuilt temples, how they continued to patronize the arts while this country was under Islamic rule is actually a testament to their commitment to Bharat and Dharma that hasn't been understood. Ajay, Kashmir. Kashmir is a typical example where invaders couldn't reach. Islam didn't come to Kashmir when Arabs came riding. It didn't happen. So it's a case study actually for people to think and ponder what happened in Kashmir and especially what you see today. You forget about today, I'll talk you about, take you back to what 11th century. So Kashmir was never invaded. Mongols did come in, but Mongols didn't follow Islam. They were there for a few years, then they went back. But what was happening is, was that Sufi, the cult which has started, and they were now coming from Persia into uh, the today's Wuhan corridor, then into Gilgit and towards the east. In Kashmir, there was a ruler, Hindu, Sahadev, and during his time, because of infighting, palace intrigues, whatever you may call it, you had a Buddhist coming from Ladakh, Rinchen, which now people debate, but ultimately he staged a mutiny. He took over the uh, reins in Kashmir, became Raja of Kashmir, and then he wanted to convert to Hindus. The High priest of Hinduism said, no, he is a born Buddhist, so he can't be made a Hindu. So he picked up Islam. Now this is much before any invasion. In any case, Kashmir was never invaded. Because between invaders and Kashmir stood Punch, the Loran Mandi, Lohara Code, which I mentioned in the previous section. So then the Sufis, what they did, it's not only Sufis coming and preaching and then Kashmir is falling for it. No, what was happening inside Kashmir, Shaivism was equally liberal. 
so when the muslim preachers came and before muslim preachers came in hindu rulers actually hired muslim fighters from punjab to guard their territory so there are very many levels levels which actually were happening so these sufis when they came in first thing they found was a kind of they were peaceful a pacific version of islam so they found a commonality where shaivism talked of unity of one and they said also we also believe in unity of one and then we had somebody called laldith laldith hospital is there in shrinagar today laleshwari who was a hindu from rishi cult and she was questioning murti puja and she was giving cursing brahmins as the trend even today so in this environment when you had a dissatisfaction running inside kashmir and you had preachers coming from outside and saying okay don't worry we all one we all believe in one god so let's unite that's how the five cults or five orders of sufism entered kashmir and hamdani being now the funny thing is mir hamdani who is supposed to be the father of uh, islam in kashmir he was he had tendencies towards shia belief his son sayed mir hamdani had leaning towards sunnism so in the process what happened in kashmir during sultan sikandar's time and so sultan sikandar sikandar who's known as buth shikhan one who used to break temples and idols his mother was a hindu his two daughters were married to hindu hindus so this was a kind of a transition happening that time and in that slowly and slowly when people started taking religion too seriously and hamdani's son when he started guiding sikandar sikandar bakht that in case you want to be true muslim do this 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 to others and that's how things went out of control and th- since then kashmir has actually been bo- on boil seven exoduses of kashmiri pandits seventh being of course what we, we mo- most of us saw first hand so this is what happened in kashmir uh, no invasion no sword but preaching followed by rulers giving too much of space to those preachers and falling into trap this is what how i put it it may sounds slightly rustic but they fell into trap and the spoil or kill the threat of so called that uh, living where people tolerated each other lived together that culture was finished once for all in 14th century and thereafter there were good people who came and then the bad people who came and the up and down and exodus kept kept on happen- happening and that continues even to, till today unfortunately you need to do a little bit of study because what's the Uh, delhi sultanate was formed the bahmani uh, sultanate came up then the deccan sultanates the gujarat sultanates uh, admiral uh, Bil- uh, billu chauhan uh, pradeep chauhan said that he will talk in the colonial section of the battle of diu and i really hope he does because you know that really gives you a very good idea of exactly the last naval stand so to speak i mean we we talk about a lot of things the battle of diu is not talked about by anybody where the portuguese took on even the egyptians were also involved so it was not just what was happening in india uh, i mean everybody seemed to be involved in what was going on in the larger in the larger scenario uh, general kj singh i'll start with you again sir uh, pakistan likes to hark back to 712c and claim its foundation was laid with the invasion of sindh any particular words of advice for the pakistani army sir See, and its people pakistan unfortunately uh is currently imploding why do i say unfortunately is because uncontrolled implosion can have an effect on us we were sitting very pretty but refugees from myanmar or in people coming from myanmar have cre- triggered a problem in manipur mizoram and northeast so implosion of pakistan has to remain controlled in some form uh the famous game changer or only hope for pakistan cpec seems to be floundering is going nowhere so it was sold by nawaz sharif as a game changer but that doesn't seem to have worked the core problem of pakistan of electricity shortage has not even got addressed in this despite so many power plants being constructed there are multiple fault lines in pakistan to these children i would just list them out so that you can read more intelligently starting from top baltis desire some independence kashmiris want pashtuns want waziris want balochis want sindhis want saraikis in south punjab want all these people want autonomy 
एंड देर आर डेमोग्राफिक फॉल्ट लाइन सुन्नी शिया अहमदिया एंड आई एम नॉट टॉकिंग ऑफ अदर्स हिंदूज एंड सिख्स हूम दे हैव एलिमिनेटेड फ्रॉम देयर कंट्री देर आर सोसाइटल फॉल्ट लाइन द डूरेंट लाइन इज नॉट वर्किंग फॉर देम नाउ तालिबान इज थिंकिंग दे नीड टू फाइंड डेप्थ इन पाकिस्तान सो एंड द फर्स्ट पार्ट इज गोइंग बैक टू वॉट कुनाल वॉज ट्राइंग टू लीड मी टू जिया उल हक मेड अ कार्डिनल सिन ही चेंज द वेरी टेम्पलेट ऑफ द पाकिस्तानी आर्मी ही मेड इट एन आर्मी विच वॉज टू लुक आफ्टर फिजिकल फ्रंटियर्स एंड ऑल्सो द आइडियोलॉजिकल फ्रंटियर्स पाकिस्तान आर्मी इज द ओनली आर्मी इन द वर्ल्ड विच लुक्स आफ्टर आइडियोलॉजिकल फ्रंटियर्स वॉट ए सिली थिंग टू डू वाई शुड दे डू इट एंड आई एड रिटर्न इट डाउन देयर मोटो वॉज सो गुड इतिहाद यकीन और तंजीम unity faith and discipline and what has he made it to he made it to iman taqwa jihad e fi sab lillah all meaning that you become theological so pakistan army you yourself know uh, all my service in indian army uh, we used to have one aim objective to discredit the pakistan army you know today we don't have to do it it's getting discredited on its own the people in pakistan are asking why do we have an army like this which is cornered all the plots all the land all the <laughs> income generating avenues and has left us at such a you know juncture so children when you do your studies try and look into this format you may get more perspective out of it thank you sai i asked the general what was his advice to the pakistanis now you i've been hearing you on some of your talks apart from pondicherry the british had obviously a very clear cut objective of dividing things and representing indian history in a certain manner which they did is everything is not painted with a black brush there for example we knew nothing about ashoka i took a lot i mean all these things came up so it's not it's not black and white it is a huge element of gray in this but how do you today how do you think give uh, this this entire business because fault lines are the last thing we can afford at the moment right. how do we really go forward where we can do this kind of a study i've been asking you this in different ways but how do we proceed on this so we are, I, i mean you, you know how how do you what would your advice be today to the rest of india about how to how to study this understand this and move forward without getting too much into this tutu bame business allow me to be slightly candid here all the student delegates there is one common aspect to their to their positions about monuments built by the mughals about the contributions of the mughals that seems to be the recurring theme they should ask themselves only one simple question and they should ask this question through their sources of history why do we not find such fantastic monuments being constructed outside the indian subcontinent if this was exactly islamic architecture why do we not find it outside of bharat or bharatiya subcontinent there is the answer to that is very uncomfortable the amount of artisans and highly skilled people who were exported as slaves to central asia during the mughal period and post that export how many similar mosques were built in central asia and in persia that's a question we never ask when people keep citing the fact that bharat's contribution to the world economy was 27% during the mughal period they don't realize a significant portion of the contribution was not coming from spices or gold it was coming from human resources being exported as slaves it's a very good point yeah. nobody wants to answer this point or nobody wants to look into this there is a fantastic let's say talk on the subject on sangam talks by this researcher uh, by the name sai priya please watch it and source after source document after document is actually presented there what does this tell you now i'll tie that into the question that you posed we are keen to look at history with rose tinted glasses 
we are hoping to find humanity in instances of barbarity when they don't exist in your own question allow me to say this there's a problem you cannot run, uh, run away from this tutu meme at all you've been trying to run away from it for a very long time you tried to run away during khilafat you failed 25 years later there's the partition of this country on religious lines citing the two nation theory two nation theory has found more than one base today one in pakistan and outside of that because pakistan is not a mentality it's not a geography it's a mentality so the question is not how do you address the state of pakistan the question is how do you address the mindset called pakistan which is not limited to a particular geography unless and until you ask this question and you're willing to take certain hard positions even uncomfortable positions you will constantly find yourself revisiting 1946 and 1947 on a regular basis the answer does not lie in burying differences the answer lies in dealing with those differences and asking hard hard questions i agree very good last person but not the least colonel raina what would your advice be to our we 370s we revoke the situation in kashmir today but you know it just takes one shot to plunge you right back into terrorism we've had this very unfortunate incident where we've lost three officers two army officers one soldier plus a police officer your message to the people of kashmir today is kashmir is waking up in fact kashmir is woken up like pakistan is a state of mind so 370 also had only a psychological thing in kashmir which was basically on ground favoring only selected few the privileged one resident of jammu and kashmir like me got no benefit other than getting if I, my daughter was to get married to outside she would have lost all her property rights whatever small I, little things i have so as a man on ground and most of us in jammu and kashmir we are very happy 370 is gone with due regards to what's happening supreme court is that remains a separate debate uh, <clears throat> we come a long distance and removal of 370 should not be seen in isolation there are a lot of things which were happening just before 370 was taken out including introducing democracy into jammu and kashmir through panchayat which we we never had proper panchayat elections then of course going strong on terrorism which was already happening uh, media management uh, i can be i i may reveal it that the way indian army learned this disruptive technology it It, only in kashmir if you go and study you will come to know what has happened there and how mindset has been changed so my request would be uh, to our future leaders here and those if somebody is listening to us in kashmir is that social media while it enables you uh, gives you a lot of information it also tends to uh, take your mind away from the actual thing and then fill it up with something else which which suits somebody else sitting away from our country across the border so as on date kashmir is peaceful military issues will keep happening if a guy has decided to get killed he will come get killed and in the process he will also try and kill a few of ours which i am sure our organization has taken enough steps our sops are being revised so that that thing doesn't worry me what worries a bit is what is happening in rajouri and punch uh, now what is happening in till now kashmir is basically they follow deobandi uh, sect and rajouri punch is like pakistan like northern pakistan is deobandi and southern is lobaik so punch rajouri belt my belt where i belong to basically barelvi so there was never a kind of unification between two ideologies and that's why you saw that even though rajouri punch had flared up once upon a time but about last 12 years it's been very peaceful so they have come up with this identity a new concept called common islamic identity cii through which they are reaching out to masses young minds and telling so what you are a brailvi so what i am deobandi let's unite that's why i said what happened in kashmir in 11th century 12th century continues to happen so this is what we must be aware of these are games being played there's islam islamic identity this is being done to get few more people killed on either side so my advice and my request and submission would be be careful stay alert see through their tricks and then choose what is best for you and for that we don't have to do anything just refer to elders elders who have seen 47 elders who have seen the bloodshed they will never give you wrong advice we tend to ignore them and then we rely on social media and that the thing in our hand and that's where things go wrong that's all i'd like to say this is what we mean by left right and center and the stones of silence we want you guys to go out there we want you to study see what the left is saying see what the right is saying but form your own opinions some of you are going to be leftist when you grow up some of you will be right as that's human nature 
but don't ever forget that we are basically indians and india will has to and always each and every time come first keep studying keep reading keep opening your eyes this is a very very complex subject you need to understand it inside out there are no there are no 100% answers on it but you will arrive at it and the more informed you are at the end of it the better better individuals you will be to handle these complex problems in the future so sir my question is for again sir jsai deepak uh, previously mr rana talked about uh, article 370 and how its abrogation has affected kashmir me personally coming from jammu and kashmir sir i have experienced it first hand how the abrogation of article 370 which can be called unconstitution obviously destabilized the area so do you think it is justified uh, the unconstitutional abrogation of the article is justified and do you think this destabilization that is occurring right now will help our country and the state as a whole develop in the future so i don't know if law is something that you would want to consider as a career of choice in the future 370 has not been abrogated because it continues to remain in the constitution what has happened is amendment of 370 not abrogation of 370 i've seen a lot of leading talking heads make the very same mistake let's not call it abrogation if the provision remains and it has undergone a change it is not abrogation it is amendment so that's point number 1 point number 2 i don't believe that the effects of the amendment of 370 should be judged so soon because you are looking at a period from 2019 to 2023 whereas 370 has been around at least for 60 70 years or at least it, it the unamended version was around for such a long time therefore i think uh, it it would be premature to say what it has done what it has not done the amendment of article 370 was not waving a magic wand and changing the situation overnight what it was meant to do according to me is to finish the sense of entitlement and specialist treatment that a particular region asked for itself under the constitution that is the first thing that we are special no you are not you are the same as everybody else every law that applies to every other region of this country shall apply to the state of jammu and kashmir or to the union of jammu and kashmir union territory was the message that had to be sent it has sent that message second there were multiple vested political interests within the valley who were holding the rest of the state hostage kashmir spoke on behalf of jammu kashmir spoke on behalf of ladakh when both of these regions were and remain capable of speaking for themselves so those voices which were being suppressed by kashmiris themselves or members of the valley themselves have been liberated so no i believe that it's certainly good for those regions three i am of the conscious view that the situation will continue to go through this destabilized period as long as we do not create enclaves for kashmiri pandits to settle with enough support and enough protection and for the rest of bharatiyas to go and buy property to live there as equal citizens that situation has not changed on the ground because support for certain separatist sentiments remains significantly people want tourists and tourist money they don't want indians that is the distinction because tourism gives you money that money is used for all sorts of anti national activities but they don't want india or indians to settle there that situation has to be addressed and i don't believe in soft peddling or mollycoddling these kind of separate sentiments we have tried that long enough and we have play, we have paid the bloody price whatever may be the price it must be paid to ensure that at the end of the day no state no region no community no group no part of this country entertains secessionist separate sentiments anywhere whether it is dravidianists or kashmiris i will treat them at par with each other if they believe that the only way they can survive is to move away from this country that cannot be accepted under any circumstances i say this as a practicing constitutional law lawyer the integrity of this country as a single political unit is sarvopari everybody else is dispensable and fungible uh, I, i want to thank general kj sir as always it's been absolute pleasure to have you with us colonel raina i have no words i am a great fan of your writings and i wish you all the very best in your future endeavors because you are perhaps in my opinion one of the most objective emerging writers in jammu and kashmir especially including the entire 47 48 operations and jay i thank you very much for finding the time and joining us here and all of you i thank you all for your time
very big hand for all three gentlemen with me. Yeah. 